Dear friends in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Heavenly Father and from His only Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. That's the note on which the Gospel lesson for today ends. But it's not the way the biblical text began. If you accepted our invitation to experience all of the holy days of Holy Week together, you know that we left this sanctuary in total silence and darkness on Friday night. The cross was veiled in black, and the Christ candle left this sanctuary symbolizing the death of Jesus. As we read the biblical text for Good Friday, including the seven last words of Christ, this, that series of passages concluded with Joseph of Arimathea, a follower of Jesus, seeking permission from Pilate to remove the body of Christ from the cross and to bury it before sundown, as was the tradition in the Jewish faith. The body needed to be buried before the beginning of the Sabbath. The tomb was one, the tomb that was offered was one that was in the process of being prepared for Joseph of Arimathea and his family. The text reads, Now in the place where he was crucified, there was a garden, and in the garden was a new tomb where no one had ever been laid. So because of the Jewish day of preparation, as the tomb was close at hand, they laid Jesus there. Just one month ago, our travel group, traveling group of pilgrims from Ascension stood at that place called Golgotha. We stepped inside the tomb that was likely the tomb described in this text, and we celebrated Holy Communion in the garden outside the tomb. It was a powerful day. Earlier that week, our tour guide, Iyad, had asked Qadir, our bus driver, so to slow down as we were traveling a secondary highway so that we could see a different tomb alongside the highway. It was complete with a, with a large round stone beside it that could be rolled across the entrance to the tomb to seal it. He wanted us to see that tomb simply as an example of what the entrance to the tomb of Jesus might have looked like. That brief stop spawned a joke on the part of Yah. He said, One day, Joseph of Arimathea came home from a hard day of work, and he said to Mrs. Arimathea, Honey, I have some good news, and I have some bad news. Which do you want to hear first? Mrs. Arimathea said, Well, let me hear the bad news first to get it out of the way. Well, you know that tomb, that lovely tomb in the garden that I've been working on for our family? Well, I gave it away today for this man named Jesus. And then she says, well, if that's the bad news, what's the good news? Well, he, he's only going to be using it for the weekend. <laughs> From me on, it was really a good tone. <laughs> serious gentlemen. For Mary, the mother of Jesus, Mary Magdalene, and the disciples, it must have seemed like an absolute gift from God to have such a beautiful, although unfinished, tomb so close and available as the Sabbath was about to begin. That Friday ended on the somber note that our Good Friday had ended on just a few days ago. But then, they hadn't created that as atmosphere. Their Friday had not ended in a recreation such as ours. They had witnessed the mockery of a trial. They had seen the brutalization of Jesus' body. They had watched him stumble through the narrow streets of old Jerusalem, carrying the heavy cross on which he was to die. They had heard and seen the spikes driven through his hands and feet. They had watched him die on the cross. Their beloved son, friend, mentor, teacher, had suffered horribly for nothing that he had 
himself had done. Despair, grief, hopelessness, disbelief, could it really have happened? The kindness of one who was a stranger to many of them had allowed Jesus' body to be taken down from the cross, hurriedly prepared for burial, and then placed respectfully in the tomb. It was to that tomb in that garden that Mary Magdalene and Peter and John came to as the Sabbath was ending that Sunday morning. The text says that it was still dark, probably much like our sunrise service this morning. They must have had some concern as to how to roll that heavy stone away from the entrance to that tomb. Yet when they got there, you know the story, the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Mary, Peter, and John, each in turn, ran to the tomb, looked inside the tomb, but found only the grave cloths lying where the body had been. The tomb was empty. And while they hadn't yet put all the pieces of the puzzle together, it was clear that Jesus had only been a weekend guest in that tomb. The two disciples returned to their homes. Mary hung around for a while longer. She had grieved the death of her beloved Jesus, and now she grieved the disappearance of his body. As she wept, through her tears she saw a man, but did not immediately recognize him. It was dark, she was confused by everything that was happening, and her eyes were filled with tears. And Jesus asked her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom do you seek? Still not clear about who she was talking to, she, thinking it was the gardener, said, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. In response to that, Jesus simply said, Mary. If you've ever had a, a spouse, a parent, a child, say your name in a way that clearly communicated relationship, love, that must have just bled through that one word, Mary. That familiar name with his now familiar voice finally caused recognition. Rabboni, which in Hebrew means teacher. Jesus told her to go to the disciples and tell them what, what she had seen and heard. And our gospel lesson ends with this verse, Mary, Mary Magdalene went and said to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. What incredible news for them and for us that Jesus had been only a weekend guest in the tomb. As Mary and the disciples must have been sitting around talking, reminiscing more and more about what he had taught them prior to his crucifixion. Hadn't he talked somewhere along the way about God destroying the temple and rebuilding it in just three days? Hadn't he talked about the need for someone to restore a broken relationship between the Heavenly Father and all of humanity and creation? Next week in our Gospel lesson, we will revisit and explore some of the, the subsequent sightings of the risen Lord following Easter Sunday. But today, we celebrate the good news of the risen Christ. We celebrate the good news that God kept His promises to His people, you and me. Suffered and died on the cross for you and me. Washed away sins, yours and mine and justified each and every one of us before the Heavenly Father. It's not a complicated story. The hard work has been done. The incredibly high price has been paid. No performance on our part is required, but response is desired. God simply invites each of us to believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. There do seem to be some natural responses on our part if we understand what God in Christ has done for us and what an incredible gift he has given to each of us. First of all, I think that the gift of, the, of this magnitude 
would elicit a life of gratitude on our part. This isn't just a casual thanks on the days we happen to think about it, but prayer as a regular discipline in our daily lives. Prayer is the language of faith between the gift giver and the gift receiver. Loving and serving the risen Christ isn't just an option on a long list of weekend opportunities. It's a way of life. It defines life. People use all kinds of excuses for, uh, for choosing not to worship God regularly, for finding lots of other things that kind of take priority in our lives. I got really an absurd uh, joke one day that kind of lifts up those kinds of excuses. The question at the heading is, why go to church? It says, one Sunday morning, a mother went in to wake her son and tell him it was time to get ready for church, to which he responded, I'm not going. Why not, she asked. I'll give you two reasons, he said. They don't like me, and I don't like them. His mother replied, I'll give you two reasons why you should go to church. You're 49 years old, and you're the pastor. <laughs> Sometimes, as we've shared as a staff, a church staff, um, who most affected you on your faith journey? And how did you get into the di discipline of regular, faithful worship? Our director of worship, Mr. Albert Sansegar, shared this, and he's told us this story several times. He said, <clears throat> it was on Sunday, it was never a question. There was never any discussion as a family. If it was Sunday, we went to church. The Sansegars went to church to worship the Lord every Sunday. And that's what I think the Lord is looking for from us. We've got to learn it if we're the adults. We get to teach it if we're the adults. But somehow it becomes a way of life. It's a conviction, not an option. It seems reasonable that I would make it a priority to worship, to love and serve this one who endured all that he did and died for me. You and I, we are Easter people, not just one day a year, but all year long. Let's live as Easter people. We do it because we've been free to live like people who love the Lord. No more worrying about or fearing for our spiritual security. And then secondly, in addition to living a life of gratitude, we are asked by Jesus to do what Jesus told Mary, and the disciples to do, to tell others what we have seen and heard. We have seen these wondrous things and heard these life-giving words through the eyes of Mary, the disciples, and others who were physically present. Their story has been passed on from generation to generation to generation and has now been entrusted to our care. Um, we have seen the life-changing experiences and heard the life and faith-giving stories from men, women, youth, and children of God who have gone before us, who live beside us, among us today, who also love and serve the Lord. We are invited to share the wondrous things God has done in our lives and the blessings that we have received from him. We join in doing this today with millions of Christians around the world who are celebrating the same good news. The news that the guy in Mrs. Arimathea's tomb was just a weekend guest. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen.